Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome to Panasonic Presents here at NAB 2019. And we are pleased to have Elle Schneider from her busy schedule. You've done eight media appearances. Yeah, thanks for having me, Neil. I love <laughs> hanging out at Panasonic. Yeah, so Elle was... The I think you were the third person to ever shoot with the Evil One in the world. Yes, that is correct. So Elle made a short part of our Eva launch, our one of the two U.S. Uh, Eva One demos. It was called Near to Su Superstition, mm -hmm. and uh, I made it. I titled it that specifically so you would have trouble pronouncing it, <laughs> and everybody else who comes to talk to me about it. <laughs> so that was um, an engineering sample camera that you had. It was so. Uh, since the release of the camera, which is, was at the end of 2017, we've had seven updates. So Elle's going to talk about a, a project that she just shot um, with uh, Atomos Recorders and ProRes RAW called Burning Glass. Yep. So do you want to talk a little bit about the, the project before we show some clips? Yeah. So um, are you guys familiar with ProRes RAW? Okay, cool. Um, so... Since the original film that I shot with uh, the EVA-1 was this Western, and we went out, and I, I shot it specifically the way I shot it because I wanted to test all sorts of crazy lighting situations that indie filmmakers might run into <coughs> that they couldn't control because I knew that uh, my counterpart, Johnny, his film was going to be all shot in studio and they could control everything. And uh, I always think it's nice to see the samples where you can't control everything and see how it stacks up. Um, but as Neil said, it was a pre-production model, and there's still firmware and noise floor and all these things being worked out. As uh, Mitch used to say when we were talking about the film last year, this is the worst you'll ever see the camera. Um, that being <coughs> said, there have been, as Neil also said, uh, seven upgrades since then, including the ability to, recruit, uh, to record up to 5.7K in ProRes RAW. And that sort of, uh, at least for right now, you know, allowing you to get the most bang for your buck out of the camera. I don't know, unless there's like a switchblade in there that you haven't told us about yet. Like, you know, that's that's probably reaching its full potential of the camera with the 5.7K RAW. So I wanted to take uh, the camera back out with the Shogun Inferno, record in ProRes RAW HQ in similar lighting conditions with kind of similar production-y style and see what the comparison was there. Um, so I made a short um, five, six minute film called The uh, Burning Glass. And uh, it's just sort of a floofy, experimental, pretentious thing because that's what I do half the time for some reason. I can't explain it, don't ask me to. Um, but uh, yeah, kind of an excuse for some beautiful cinematography. We went out into the desert and into the mountains. We're shooting in a lot of snow up in the Mammoth Lakes area in February, which uh, was an interesting experience this year. You, you seem to always pick re the hardest, harshest conditions you can with uh, the camera. You're like the Werner Herzog of... Yeah, mm. I, I, it's, there's definitely a masochistic streak, but I think there's also like a, I don't get to go out into nature very often in LA, so it's an excuse to do that. Um, I love shooting natural, you know, nature-y, stuff and uh, it's very beautiful and scenic and I think uh, I think there's sort of two types of filmmakers honestly there's people that if they're doing tests they go into the studio and shoot with models and there's filmmakers that go into nature and shoot pretty sunsets and I think I'm the latter um, in this case I chose pretty snow and a frozen lake and 20 degrees and 8 foot of snow which was a challenge we kept having to, as it, uh, between when we planned our shoot and when we actually shot, there were 150 inches of snowfall, uh, which changed things a little bit. And as uh, the snow kept going and kept going and all the roads were getting closed, we're like, oh, we're going to film up here. I guess we're going to film here and then here and then here. And I think we moved at least 50 miles south of our original locations because we couldn't even drive there. Um, but uh, it was fun. Let's, uh, Dan, if you could roll the, the film. So yeah. There's no sound, so I'll play gonna without sound so I can rap over it. Right there. Or experimental poetry. Hey, look, stuff is happening. 
Um, also, if you guys have questions, let me know. Um, so uh, my workflow for this is I shot in ProRes RAW, which meant I was editing Final Cut 10 because that is the program that's available as far as editing is concerned for working in ProRes RAW right now. And uh, I've worked in Final Cut 10 before, so it wasn't that difficult. Um, but I did decide to grade in Resolve just so that I could really kind of get under the hood of the footage and see what it was doing. Um, so I round tripped it from Resolve back into Final Cut and finish it up in Final Cut. And I was really pleased with uh, everything I was getting. You know, the, there's a lot of detail in the clouds, in the mountains. I was picking a costume that would be particularly hard, um, fairly bright. It has fine um, lines on it. She's wearing like this lacy shawl and these lacy gloves. So I tried to make this sort of as hard visually for digital cameras as possible and everything held up really well. And uh, the noise, when there are shots with noise, is pretty elegant, which is great. You're not seeing blockiness. That's a lot of what you're getting out of the ProRes RAW. You don't really see that much blockiness in this camera to begin with, but when you're putting it in specifically difficult lighting conditions, sometimes that's just what's gonna happen. So for some of these shots, were you shooting in uh you know, were you using the 2500 ISO? Or maybe not this shot, but some of the darker scenes? Um, I shot predominantly 800 on the entire thing, although the entire thing is 4K60. So it's not like sort of the true 800 because it knocks it down to 400 once oh. you go to 60, right? So then you're kind of, you're starting at the base, but it's really somewhere around the tw uh, 12, 000, or 1200, 1600 area, mostly, I would think. Um, I don't know exactly what the calculations are on yeah, that. Um, but then we did shoot on um, 2,500 a little bit for the night scenes, which come up in a minute or two. Um, I tried not to go too high with it because I was really shooting, like, in a mountain, um, covered in snow, where there was, like, all sorts of creepy noises and hopefully not bears, but we didn't know. I mean, we were in a campground, yeah. We were in a, but there were, it was a campground with bear boxes. So um, because of the snowfall, there was only one campground that was still open in the entire area. And it was still covered in two to three feet of snow. But we were like, hey, it's only two to three feet of snow. It's not six to eight feet. Yeah. Um, and we wanted to make sure when we were doing fire stuff for that, that we were in you know a safe fire pit set up situation. And then shooting in... in Daylight with bright so, by white. The way, this is this is a campground. That's how much snow is there that you can't even see that there are there are like grills and stuff under there. There's bear boxes and stuff under there. You can't even see it. There's so much snow. But yes. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about the the dynamic range of the camera since you were shooting with such extremes in terms of your highlights with that bright yeah, white I mean, snow. Yeah, I mean we're definitely having to protect for the snow because snow blown out would be awful. Snow is also reflecting a ton of light right. up onto the subject, and that makes life tough all over also. So I was really pleased. You know, we were protecting the highlights, but I, we were able to get, you know, all of the detail in the darks as well. And one of the things that I really like about RAW is it's not going to magically give you more dynamic range than the camera has, but it's able to handle the stop in between there a lot more elegantly sometimes. So I didn't find that I lost anything. Um, there are some places where once you grade it, you kind of have, are having to make a choice of like, do I want to keep more detail in the clouds or do I want to get some of the mountains a little bit brighter? So there were things that I chose there, but things in like sunsets and you know all the detail in these clouds looks great. Um, so what were some of your influences on the, the look of the film? What were some of the influences? I watched The Great Silence. There's two um, uh, snow westerns. The other one is called Track of the Cat. Track of the Cat is a really interesting film. Uh, it's Robert Mitchum and Tab Hunter and a bunch of other people. Okay. And um, 
it's kind of a convoluted plot, but it's shot in an almost monochromatic way in its production design. It's from the 1950s, so it's extraordinarily stagey. Okay. It sounds cooler to say it was production design in a monochrome <laughs> way than if you watched it now. It feels very dated, yeah. but I thought that was a really interesting concept. It's probably something I will one day go back and do again yeah. more, but they're all wearing sort of black and white clothes, and they're, it's all snow, so even though they're out in the forest, it's like graded so the trees are very dark. You're yeah. seeing kind of blue, gray skies. So I was looking at that a lot. And I, I also wanted to go back to Near to Superstition where we did a bunch of fire stuff and uh, see how this was going to hold the detail a little bit more. And I think it looks really great. I did fill it out a little bit more mm -hmm. because uh, we were at such a high altitude. It was really, really difficult. It took us two and a half hours to get the fire started initially. Um, so we lost a lot of time on our first day doing that. Um, but just to make sure um, we had enough of what we needed, I brought some hive lights out. And so we did, because they get these great colored WASP 100C lights, and I filled in the fire a little bit just to make sure there was consistency throughout. Because one thing that we did face on Near to Superstition, which thankfully we didn't face here, was extreme wind, like what we're dealing with here. Yeah. Trying to shoot a fire scene with that kind of wind. Um, and keep any kind of consistency on the actors' faces is pretty tough. But I like shooting with real fire and not flicker boxes because I think that we can kind of tell pretty quickly if it's like looking right yeah. or not. And I also don't like to backlight too crazily when I'm doing fire stuff because, like, again, our brain is like, that tree wouldn't be blue cast back there. Like, we know there's like a light set up off the yeah. side, and I, I always get distracted by that. So talk a little bit about the gear that you use for this. Like, what lenses did you use? So I shot with all Sigma Cine Primes, including their new 40 and 105, which had not been released yet, but you can now go see at the show. Um, and for a handful of things, so we didn't have a tripod. There's so much snow, and we are often having to, like, walk out, you know, a half mile. Um, and there were some places where I was just nervous about having too much weight. So actually, if you go back to one slide before this, uh, this is Convict Lake. And the, there's a lake behind me, and it's completely frozen over and covered with snow. But I am a safe filmmaker. And while there's a lot of tourists and Instagram influencers who are out there running around on the frozen lake, I was not going to ask my actress to do that, because she's a friend of mine, and I would like her to not die. Um, so I was really careful to not bring too much heavy stuff, especially when we were shooting right here, because um, it sort of, uh, you know, it gets deeper as you go in. So we probably were on some ice at some point, but just like right where the shore was. Um, but the, a tripod is gonna be heavy enough to sink down through the snow. And certainly when we were tracking out into the next section, um, uh, next slide, Dan. Where we were walking, have my, it, it just again, a huge amount of snow. You can see in the background that little brown thing, that's a bear box. So if you've ever been camping, those are usually about three feet, three and a half feet high, and that one's almost completely covered in snow. Um, and if we had put a tripod in, it would have just been really difficult yeah. to deal with. So I actually use the Ronin S instead of a tripod because the setup with the EVA, which is a Frankenstein monster that's not supposed to exist because um, the EVA is slightly too heavy of a payload with a lens to work on the Ronin S, except DJI helped me balance it so we were able to make it work. And I was, all, I, so for this one setup, which is about six or seven shots, I used the Sigma R18-35, um, which we had balanced on there at Sigma. Um, Sigma and DJ are across the street from each other, so it's yeah. easy to partner with both of them, and it's a lot of fun, and they're great people. Um, so they, they helped me set up this rig going in there so I could walk around with that thing instead of having to drag a giant tripod through the snow. And what was cool is that it ended up being light enough that it sat on top of the snow. So I'm sunk into the snow here like you know, above my knees, but the camera's just kind of hanging out, sitting on top of the snow, which was great. Um, so 
There's the 105. I also use a shape rig for my rig. I tend to play pretty rough when I'm in these like crazy shoots. Yeah. So <laughs> apologies to shape, but I busted the mat box uh, on the first day. Um, so I'm switching it out for a uh, swing away, but it was cool because the filter tray was really robust, so the filter tray was fine. I just lost the flags. So what sort of filters were you using? So I was using a set of the, the Tiffin ND Naturals, okay. which are really clear NDs with no kind of pollution or IR issues. Um, and I was using a 1 8 Hollywood Black Magic in there. Um, Actually, I lied. Line. I think I might have used a one eighth Pro Mist because I was only using Tiffin filters, and they don't make Black Magic, do they? So uh, yeah, it would have been um, I think one fourth Pro Mist. So did you capture in ProRes Raw or ProRes Raw HQ? ProRes Raw HQ. When in Rome, if I'm going to bother capturing ProRes Raw, I was going to go HQ and see mm -hmm. what I was getting. And in terms of the file sizes, is there a huge difference between? HQ and regular ProRes RAW? Or? I don't know if it's a huge difference. Um, I didn't capture significantly more than I would on a normal short film or music video shoot, which was great. Like the file size really worked for me, although I overshot by one shot, Neil. I had a two terabyte drive and I shot two terabytes and four gigabytes of footage. Wow. So I had to have a second drive, second drive just for that last little one. Um, but yeah, it was pretty efficient um, file-wise, and it plays really well in Final Cut. I did end up doing a proxy <laughs> workflow just because my desktop is old, and the drive that I was using wasn't an SSD. So just to make sure, once I started putting effects and stuff, that it could play properly, I did use Final Cut's proxy workflow. So before we open up to the audience, I wanted to ask you about your Final Cut Pro. So what was what was your workflow um, like for post? Okay, so you import everything in, and then Final Cut has a pretty seamless proxy setup. You kind of just select all the clips that you want to make proxies of, and you right-click, and then you say transcode media, and then you say yes, and then it does it for you. Um, the proxy uh, creation takes a little bit of time, so I went away to South by Southwest, leaving it rendering, noting that it would be good to go when I got back. and. Um, once I started cutting, it was pretty easy. Um, it, you know, it has the Panasonic LUT built into Final Cut 10, so I was able to just throw that on, which gave me a, a really good base for when I started yeah. to edit. Um, when I was done cutting, I um, <coughs> exported because there's a share function, yeah. and I exported all of the clips out to Resolve, but with no LUT on it at all. Now, here's the thing: is that uh, as of this show, you, you exported 5.7K. Uh, well, I shot the whole thing 4K60, so I exported. Oh, yeah, I exported the um, 4K with no LUT on it out to ProRes 4444XQ um, because until the show, there weren't any of the Pro color grading suites that could take ProRes RAW natively, and I knew that I wanted to yuck it up more than Final Cut would allow me to do. Final Cut has really good grading in it, but I tend to go overboard and I like the node-based workflows. So I took it out and took it into Resolve. Um, and I'm also pretty familiar with Resolve, so like I, I can, it makes it easier for me to compare it um, to other projects that I've done in the past, whereas with Final Cut, I'm not as familiar with using it on multiple projects. Yeah. Um, and I really just wanted to see the breaking point. I wanted to see where I could like do stuff um, because I, as a DP, um, and particularly as an indie DP, I, I'm starting more and more to view color as like the last third of the cinematography process. And I don't mean that in terms of like a, the post process, I mean it in terms of the production process. Yeah. Um, because on lower budget shoots, and this was a lower budget shoot, and we're out in nature, and we can't control things like what color the sunset is going to be, um, what color you know the clouds are, or where the clouds are going to come from. Um, but if you understand what your tools and post can give you, you can say, okay, well, if I shoot this part of the sunset, there's enough of that hue in it that I know I'll be able to do what I need with the shot in post. 
So the, rather than be sad or have to go shoot five different sunsets and pick one, there's ways that you can shoot stuff knowing what you're capable of doing it later to augment it to get what you're actually looking for on set. Um, because you know sometimes you don't have a condor, and you know this this whole project had a other than myself a three person crew. Wow. I had a PA, a gaffer, and a makeup hair. And uh, on something that small, you know, you it was all natural lit except for the fire stuff where we had the hive lights. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions for Al? Yes. Can you give me the mic? So I got here late, so you might already touch on this. Mm -hmm. I heard you mentioning Sigma lenses. Yes. Uh, have you looked at a, a number of different lenses, and why did you pick the Sigma? Or is it just happened to be that one for that? So I, I hadn't used the Sigma lenses a lot until I shot the film for Panasonic in 2017. And that was the first time I had encountered the Sigma Cine lenses, and I really like them. I particularly <coughs> like the way the light falls off on them. It's very bloomy, um, but soft. Um, whereas a lot of the sharper, newer lenses, it's like more of a harsh fall off, and you have to put a lot more filtration on them to get them to look nice. Um, I think one thing I really like about them also is that they... Um, they are modern looking without feeling too sharp. And I think that's something that with, as resolutions get higher, um, that's something that we're all struggling with a lot is like keeping it from looking too video or too modern. And for anything that's sort of gonna be period piece, like if you feel like, you know, the, mo the actor just walked by you five seconds ago because it's so clean and sharp, you're never gonna buy the narrative that they're trying to sell you. Um, so I felt like the Sigma lenses actually really did a good job sort of um, disguising the fact that they were modern and new lenses. So I've started using them more and more. Um, I just really like them. I shoot sometimes with Zeiss. I shoot sometimes with Canon. Um, those are probably like the three companies that I use most frequently. I use Canon mostly for documentaries. I use Zeiss for music videos and other things. But... Um, I don't know, the, the Sigmas have have this very like neutral look that I really like, and they j have just uh, announced that they're coming out with this 40 and 105, and 40 is a, 40 is a really great um, size in prime, because, you know, we, traditionally we're shooting close-ups and things on a, um, like an 85 or a 100 or a 50, and it gives us this kind of classic, but it's very sort of static and um, portraity look. And a lot of DPs now, especially because there's, uh, with all these rigs, there's more ability for movement. People are moving into like a 28, 30 range to do stuff and just getting closer because it like feels more dynamic. Because when you're on such a telephoto lens, you move a little bit, it doesn't really, um, shift the image very much, but when you're on a wider lens, you feel the motion more when you go close. So people are starting to experiment more with wider lenses on people, and 40 is sort of that sweet spot where it's like not quite at a 50, which is sort of the standard, but it's not quite exaggerated in the way that using like a 24 or a 35 could be depending on what you're shooting. Um, and I really wanted to try that out, so I conned them into lending me their two prototypes for this shoot. Uh, actually, if you want to ask Elle a question, uh, we have to move on to the next uh, presentation. How so. dare you? <laughs> I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank Elle Schneider. Elle, you made a really gorgeous looking film. Thank so you very congratulations. much. Congratulations. Um, and please visit to the other side of the booth. Uh, we have some EVA 1 set up, and uh, you can also visit Atomos' booth and ask them all about ProRes Raw. Can. And I'll be there yakking about it again later. <laughs> <laughs>